new age old tricks. The reason for the title is simply to draw your attention to a truism. That's one of the words that no one is supposed to use anymore. We should not speak of truisms. Platitudes are out. They went out with moral absolutes. But we call it a truism simply to indicate the fact that when we deal with errors, especially errors that touch the basics of human life, where we came from, what we are, where we are going, there is nothing new. Anyone who labels anything that can be easily identified as an error about human life, its origin, its conduct, and its ultimate goals, as new is a fraud. All new heresies are as old as Adam and Eve. And if you scratch beneath the surface of what is called today the New Age that was so accurately described from a phenomenological, empirical, scientific point of view by Father Pacwa two weeks ago, if you scratch beneath the surface and pick out with the benefit of the light of faith, knowledge of the history of the church, of what is called, quote, unquote, spirituality, spiritual movements, you will discover quite quickly that the old tricks disguised as a new age are easily shown to be what they are. Now, any of you who are willing to stand up and identify yourselves as members of my generation, you say those of us who are 55 or better, I won't, we leave it at the discreet 55, I'm sorry, but, okay, and there are, we'll remember how all of the things that seem to be so popular amongst Catholics today, struck us initially as rather odd. It was easy enough to acknowledge the fact that people did these things. But in those days, we associated these things mainly with people who joined the Kingdom Halls, who read the Watchtower regularly, who belonged to the Latter-day Saints, Groups of this kind, we pity these people. We understood why they might be drawn into this, but we could not appreciate how Catholics could be drawn to this because we were not ourselves drawn to this thing. There was absolutely no attraction whatsoever. I don't mean to say, therefore, that we of the older generation did not have our faults. Some of them were rather gross. But at least one thing we were sure of, we hadn't lost our reason. And that is one of the most significant features about the new age. It is one of the first points that we note who take dogmatic faith seriously. By dogmatic faith, I don't mean anything very abstruse. I simply mean that we take the catechism seriously, that we take it at face value, and we acknowledge that if we believe, we shall stay on the straight and narrow, at least as far as our judgments are concerned. And if we don't believe, we shall soon be in the never-never land of moral confusion. And that, of course, is the first thing that we note about the New Age. It's the silly season. If it were just silly, clowning around, it wouldn't be that bad. But now, is silliness itself is being glorified as wisdom. 
That is the key point to note. There is no way in which a Catholic who has been brought up in the faith, so I'm not talking about our statements in faith, our knowledge of the faith, we subscribe to it, we critique our consciousness accordingly. In order to understand and appreciate people, especially Catholics, who have gotten themselves involved in the New Age movement, we have to remember that the New Age is simply one of the many extreme consequences of the glorification of the absurd, of the irrational, of the purely emotional for its own sake. And until we grasp that point, we will not be able to understand what is going on. But if we accept that as a starting point, we can appreciate to a certain extent that God's permission that such a movement should surface is rather providential. It's a confirmation about how right our faith really is. And what a blessing it is to have that kind of guidance. That's the very general introductory premise for this talk. I don't want to repeat the description of New Age that was done quite well by Father Papua. I just want to pick out two very essential points from a doctrinal standpoint. What stands behind all of these strange practices? And what particular teachings of our Lord and also of sacred scripture, both of the Old and the New Testament, help us to understand what stands at the heart of all of these apparently unrelated contradictory practices? There are two errors. Father Pakwa touched on both of them, among many others. First, the denial of good and evil. That is one of the common elements that runs through all of the very different and sometimes contradictory manifestations of the new age. By the way, to those who are convinced new ages, Contradictions are no problem. That once you abdicate the use of reason, what's a minor contradiction among friends? You can be one thing today, another thing tomorrow. You can say whatever you want, and whatever you say is right because you say it. And if somebody contradicts you, that serves a purpose also. The denial of the difference between good and evil. I think that needs to be qualified by pointing out that the denial of the difference between good and evil is not the denial of good, but a denial of what a believer considers the criterion, the norm, by which we differentiate between what is good and what is bad. The new age will find that within itself, which is simply an extreme form of what is a very common position at the present time. You will find if you read the recent encyclical of our Holy Father, The Splendor of Truth, that the autonomous conscience is one of the characteristic features of the modern world, and it has been that way for quite a number of centuries. The autonomous conscience, which holds that in determining what may or may not be done, I have the last word in deciding. To what does this correspond in sacred scripture? Nothing more or less than eating of the forbidden. How is it described in Genesis? Very accurately, 
But so often, we don't train our minds to examine carefully what is being said, what has been written. Not to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We may put that in terms a little bit more familiar, easier for our understanding. I simply say, the person who believes God takes God's word for it, that it is not to be done and therefore it is evil. And therefore ultimately it is harmful. He doesn't need to try it out. What did the serpent suggest? to our first parents. Don't decide about the difference between good and evil. On God's word, that's depressing. You try it out. If it tastes good, if it gives you pleasure, it's okay and you're okay. Nothing will happen. Don't worry about that little incident called death. And if it's not okay, don't do it again. It's your life. It's your choice. That is what is so significant about the point that was underscored by Father Papa. That New Agers universally reject any fixed distinction between good and evil. I mean moral good and moral evil. Moral good is that deserves a reward at the end of life. Moral evil that deserves a punishment if it is not executed. And we can see immediately what the silliness is all about. It's a thin disguise for what is an almost universal position outside the Catholic Church today. There's no difference between moral evil and physical evil. It's okay as long as you don't burn down somebody's house. So don't tell me where I'm to speak tonight on your business. Is it hurting you? Once we make the link between A, adopting the position of the serpent, in regard to the positive commandments of God and good and evil, reward and punishment, heaven and hell, we inevitably will find ourselves sympathetic, given the right circumstances, to those who call themselves today new agents. A hundred years ago, they were called Theosophists, the disciples of Madame Blavatsky whose works are still very much in circulation. Or Mrs. Besant. Chesterton describes the difference between those two ladies as the difference between A, an interesting scallywag, that was Madame Blavatsky, and a nice broad. But in either case, you're dealing with someone who's peddling a lie. So that's the first error. As soon as you see the thread that unites all of these strange practices, you have an insight into a position that when it is initially adopted does not seem to involve any silliness. Most people think that dissenting from humani vitae is reasonable and that the unreasonable position is that of some intransitive dogmatist like yours truly. Me. Lacking in consideration, uncaring, Unmerciful, the born persecutor, a new Torquemada. You know, you can just see me there with that torch ready to put it to the straw. That's the commonplace. It's part of the psychological victory of those who have been able to permeate the whole of our culture with what is called secular thinking. Don't ever let anybody form your mind, let alone your conscience. It is, in fact, the inhuman position. We'll come to that a little later, but that's error number one. The second error, 
the one that gives this movement its name, New Age, is not really new at all. It's one of the earliest heresies to surface in the church. And it has a name in history that if you have anything at all to do with extreme Protestant sects, you will find that they talk about this all the time. It's called Kiliism or Millenarianism. It means believing in the millennium, the thousand years that are going to precede the final judgment, where there will be a first resurrection of the just, not unto glory in heaven, but unto glory on earth. Of what is this a version? It's a version of the political messianism of the Jewish leaders who in Judaism are. And as soon as you see the connection, you can easily go back and take up your New Testament and read some of those arguments. My kingdom is not of this world. Now we can begin to understand why our Lord would have nothing to do with those who wanted to make him a political messiah, to make him the one who with his power would reverse the relationship between Roman and Jew. The Jew would no longer take orders from the Roman, the Jew was going to give orders to the Roman and the Greek. That is not why our Lord came. These are the two fundamental errors of the New Age movement, from a straightforward doctrinal, catechetical point of view. Any Catholic who understands the basic teaching of Christ on these two points, and that's what we will expound briefly, anyone who has followed the teaching of the Catechism on this point, you need not go so far as to seriously study somebody like St. Bonaventure or St. Thomas, although it's highly recommended. But if you have these insights, you'll find that St. Thomas and St. Bonaventure are far more interesting than those who make a scientific analysis, and indeed, who provide some very practical, positive things that can be done about this. Hopefully, at the end, there will be time enough for you to mention one or two of them. But these are the two errors. That indicate uh, where, in fact, we are to look in the teaching of the church, in the teaching of our Lord for enlightenment. What's the New Age all about? What do these silly things really confirm? How do they show that we are right in what we have to do? We come to realize that our Lord told us these things for a very practical reason. And that if we hold to them, before we get involved in any of these practices which are extraordinarily dangerous, not because they make you drunk, not because you might become an addict taking cocaine or heroin, but because you will be softened, opened up to the influence of the prince of this world. And I don't mean simply possession or obsession. I'm talking about those vexations, those subtle manipulations which when they have gone far enough, lead a person to commit the unforgivable sin, to sin against the light. And that's what repudiating, especially at the natural level, of the light of truth, of the light of the intellect. We'll put it in a more exact way. What is the light that enlightens every man coming to this world, the child of Mary? Remember that particular point. And now what do I want to talk about, expound very briefly, three points before I get to the concluding recommendations. First of all, we have to examine what is meant by Kiliism, millenarianism, and so forth. What are its characteristic features historically? And what form do they take in the modern world? The modern world bonds itself on being secular. They want you to think and the prince of this world wants you to think that secular means no religion. That separation of church and state means American politics is perfectly neutral. That is so much bunkum. There is no such thing. In the, only in the myth is there separation of church.
churches, they in the reality, there are all kinds of points of intersection. And the same thing is true. There is no such thing as pure secular thought. What used to be identified solely with a bizarre sect like the Jehovah Witnesses and their expectation of the coming of Christ or the millennium, they were always postponed when it didn't arrive. Of course, we simply laughed at that. This is a way of putting them down. They never, you can't shake their confidence. It doesn't bother them. What we forget is that they're not bothered by lies. They're not bothered by intellectual dishonesty. They are not bothered by contradictions. The person who has repudiated the light of truth, the person who has taken the position that it doesn't matter that there is no such thing as an eternal truth, is always going to grow right on, no matter how many contradictions we turn up, until we deal with the fundamental difficulty, which is a repudiation of the light a repudiation of the very nature of the intellect itself that is made not for tinkering with X number of facts, X number of phenomena, rearranging the furniture so that life would be more comfortable. The intellect was given to us so that we might know the truth and we shall indeed have a beast on our hands if it is deprived of that. So I want to talk about today what are the component elements and how is it that any group that is chiliastic, any group that is always trying to usher in a new age, a paradise on earth, whether it's kingdom hall or whether it's social progress, what is called the system of idealism, interpretation of history of a certain German philosopher whose name is Hegel whose theories were popularized by the late Jesuit Teilhard de Chardin. We sometimes go under the very popular term, evolution. Everything is changing. We leave aside now if there are such things as legitimate scientific, I don't want to get into an argument about those things. I am talking about an underlying effect that change is more important than, than that which is fixed. Why do these people always expect the new age? Why do they engage in these silly practices, mind-boggling in more ways than, uh, ways than one? Because they must constantly spin wheels to make sure that the Valhalla, the paradise, gets here and that they're part of it. That is why as soon as you deny the eternal, as soon as you deny there is such a thing as a fixed, unchanging dogma, as soon as you deny when our Lord said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. As soon as you deny what St. Paul says in the letter to the Hebrews, Jesus Christ, yesterday, today, now and forever, you are practically speaking condemned to opt, that is, if you make any pretext of being happy, 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 for some kind of paradise on earth. You can call it the new age, you can call it uh, the new frontier. You can call it uh, the new deal. You can call it the square deal. It is one of the fundamental errors of the modern secular life. I don't care whose party it is. That politics is that. Why do they say politics is everything? And it is your bounden duty to vote. You may have no one to vote for, but if you don't vote, you commit the unforgivable sin. Why? They are demanding that you subscribe to the assumptions behind this kind of a thing. You can see why it is wrong when you simply note that the underlying assumptions of the scientific elite who say that science has X'd out God, which it, genuine science has not done, and the silly season. Historically, this is true in modern times, it was true in the Middle Ages, especially the late Middle Ages, and we Franciscans should never forget it, because we have some rather strange brothers who illustrate exactly what is involved here. The alliance between the secular politician sociologist, read William of Ockham, and the wild brethren of the free spirit. And when I say free spirit, I mean free, where freedom equals do whatever you please. 
and let the Pope take the hindmost. They were called Fraticelli. They were called Brethren of the Free Spirit. They were spiritual Franciscans. Everybody thinks it's a great thing to be spiritual. You must be holy. That's because we have collapsed the distinction between good and evil. There is a good and holy spirit. That's, he is the Holy Spirit. But remember always, the prince of this world is very spiritual. Mary Baker Eddy was very spiritual. Madame Blavatsky was very spiritual. And all of these ladies, and the gentlemen who were there, by the way, in those days the ladies caught the shots, almost inevitably. All of these people proclaimed themselves as being very, very spiritual. So my first point, I've already talked about the filialism. Second point will be what happens when you adopt that point of view, that perspective. And a great many people, including at the present time, a great many Catholics, we don't know how many, but they are surely influenced by these things. What happens? Two things will happen. First, there will be a transposition, we might say, of what is the spatial center of our existence. From the word incarnate, the Son of Mary, and the cross, to something inside me. And the second thing that happens, there will be a transposition of goals. Instead of eternity, the resurrection after death, not before, after. Our Lord didn't come down from the cross to satisfy his crit, his enemies. Come down and we'll believe you. No, he rose from the dead, which didn't satisfy them, which should tell us something about uh, some of the characteristic underlying assumptions of people who would never be caught dead in a new age seance would never visit a kingdom hall or any place like that. And yet, historically, those who collapse heaven make their own insides rather than the heart of Christ the center of their life. Those who collapse eternity into some period of history that they glorify, usually the end period, that will be perpetuated you find it in the Quran. You will find it uh, in all of these heretical sects down through the ages. The interesting thing is that those who profound, propound the philosophical, we would call them philosophical, but it would be better to call them pseudo-dogma. What St. Paul calls in the letter to Timothy, profane, vulgar, cheap novelty, of words. Words without any relationship to meaning. Words without any relationship to reality. Words used indiscriminately. The secular sociologist, the secular politician, the secular philosopher, the pseudo-theologian in practice are always allied with the New Age group, the weird sectarian. You don't have to go into all of the underlying philosophy. It's enough simply to note the connection. Interesting. And it always follows on an abandonment of what Christ has taught us. There he is. Don't go out. When you see these things, flee to the desert. But don't listen to anyone else, says St. Paul, who says, he has a better doctrine, a new doctrine, even if it is an angel from heaven. Because an angel from heaven it teaches you something different from what you find in the catechism of the Catholic Church. He's an angel, all right, but he is not a good angel. That is the point. If you abandon the criterion of truth, the criterion of goodness, the norm for differentiating between good and evil, good, better, and best, that is given to us by the one who can rightly claim to be the truth itself. I am the way, the truth, and the, I am the light of the world. He is the light that enlightens every man who cometh into the world. He came into the world, and the world did not know him. He came unto his own, 
may his own be seen to his life. But to those who believe, here is our light. The light of faith. If we think, use our God-given powers to reflect on the phenomena happening before us, we will understand. You don't need a PhD. You need only be attentive to the characters. Now, when we examine the history of this particular era, political messianism, those who promise a paradise on earth will do say that Christ is the one who will usher in the paradise. Conclusion, he's one of the many antichrists. He's pseudo. He is a misrepresentation and he is promising you something that can never come true. The sad part is that when people realize that, they don't want to admit that they've been conned. We can understand that. Here I simply want to point out the dynamics that are going on. Now, what is this political messianism, Hillianism, militarism, new age, paradise on earth, social progress, Manifest destiny used to be called at the end of the 19th century in the United States. The United States had a manifest destiny practically as though the American political experiment was indeed the paradise, the alternative to the kingdom of God and his justice. Not just in America, practically all over the world. You must look at the ambivalence of the modern secular social experiment. It brings many things that are attractive. It's true. They give a certain pleasure initially. But we must always ask the question, what does it profit a man if he gained the whole world and in the process lose his soul? Soul is the correct word. It's the one I've always used. This kind of heresy that surfaced and is reflected in the writings of the fathers of the church attracted many Catholics in those days, began first by saying the resurrection was for the just was going to occur before the end, before, in fact, the final judgment came. They allowed for a certain death, but they also introduced the possibility of a paradise on earth. That is the first element. And it's only one step from that kind of false notion about when the resurrection for some will occur, to the introduction a la Hegel, a la Tehar de Chardin, a la host of other thinkers at the present time, the notion that you don't have to worry about death anymore. You can make it, you can bypass all those problems. Therefore, you don't have to worry about taking up your cross daily. No need for the old asceticism. It serves no purpose whatsoever that you should uh, fast on Friday, that you should fast before you receive Holy Communion, that you should take seriously Our Lady's request to pray and do penance, that it's a great thing, as St. Bonaventure and St. Thomas say, the greatest thing possible that you can recommend, advise anyone to do. And that's enter the cloister of God. Shut yourself up behind bars. Some years ago, I once heard a gentleman attending a mass in the chapel of Strict Carmelite Monastery make the remark after the Holy Thursday Mass, My God, they still have women locked up in the Catholic Church behind bars. I thought the Vatican Council had put an end to all that nonsense. So I said afterwards, sir, I said, uh, it's a question of perspective. You think the good holy nuns are in prison, but actually they're looking in on our prison. It's a case of where you locate paradise. The whole modern experiment, technology, science, okay, latest inventions, comforts. What's the opposite word? Comfort. If you see it from, that doesn't mean you have to put your feet in cold water during Lent and recite 150 psalms as the legend of St. Patrick used to have. He may well have done it. The Irish are capable of quite something when they get going. But we leave aside the facticity of that legend. 
Our Lord never requires that of the average follower. He does ask us to do penance. He does ask us to fast. He does ask us to undertake works of self-denial. But as soon as you make this assumption, and it can be made in a thousand different ways, ways, you must expect a paradise on earth. Now, the old Protestant sects, they only go halfway. They seem to be, in a certain sense, very fundamentalistic. But it's a kind of a wooden orthodoxy. It's unthinking. That's what's wrong with it. A lot of single points are all right. But taken as a whole, it's very dangerous. Because in the end, and you substitute faith for reason. And what happens? You end up with all of the secularists. But the secularists aren't all that balanced either. They end up with the New Agers. But once you realize that all of this is very hollow and you don't want to admit it, you have to have a good cover. You have to pretend to yourself that's all it is. When you go out and get loaded, whether it's with the, the pleasant way with Johnny Barleycorn, or whether you, as were, you Dr. O'Leary's LSD, but after a while comes the hangover. It's the law of diminishing returns. That's the first point historically. The second point is what we today would call Pentecostalism. But in our Western world, it began with the century of St. Dominic and St. Francis, called Jogmatism, after a certain abbot, Joachim of Fiore, who himself was not that, but he has a certain number of errors. Instead of talking about the resurrection, he talked about the age of the Holy Spirit. We have the age of the Father, and we have the age of the Son, that's great. But finally, history is going to conclude with the age of the Holy Spirit, and that's paradise. And sure enough, it produced the same. Instead of beginning with the desire to see a material, political, social triumph of Christians over all their enemies, just as the Jews wanted to see a social, political vindication of all those they thought were the enemy. In the modern Western world, which didn't begin with Vatican II, it began around the time Peter of Bernadotte, that's the father of St. Francis, along with other enterprising commercial industrial geniuses, ushered in what we call the modern world, which also began at the University of Paris and which accounts for the controversies in which St. Thomas and St. Bonaventure were involved with the modern secular spirit. Except then it affected only a few people, the commercial elite, the upper middle class, and the intellectual elite. Now it touches everybody. These ideas have trickled down, and everybody more or less is under their influence. What happened, instead of beginning with the ancient notion of an anticipated resurrection, the modern Western heretic, very practical in this regard, begins with the notion of an interior experience that is independent of the canonical church. Today they use the word institutional. If you read the works of Hans Kuhn, late Catholic theologian of Cubic, you will find that he always is talking about that awful, awful, horrible, repressive, institutional church. And especially with those mean folks who don't pay attention to Hans Kuhn and admit that there's no such thing as infallibility, and no such thing as a primacy of jurisdiction. All you have to do is note institutional equals canonical equals a non-spiritual church. Liturgy, sacraments, catechisms, authority, especially that. that. That's always oppressive by definition. Therefore, we need to transcend that. In the modern age, and people don't want to use all of those pious terms of the Abbot Joachim, they talk about coming of age. We have become mature. Those who follow the old-fashioned almost Neanderthal 
views of the petty catechism are obviously immature. They are abnormal. The only way you can attain normalcy according to this point of view is to shed all of those characteristics, all of those things that to most of us represent normal personality and find the real spirit deep within you. I kind of shortened the presentation merely to call your attention to a certain link. Once in practice, a community, a civilization, a culture, accepts these assumptions as a given. It's only a matter of time. When you begin to say, and this is the second point I wanted to talk about, John, it's not a question of the practice of virtue. It's not a question of good discipline of hard work at study and even harder work at virtue. All those mean daddies who spank their children when they misbehaved. By definition, it may have been only a little pat on the rear end, but by definition, that's child abuse. Now, there is such a thing as child abuse, but the only way in which we can define what is use and abuse is to have an objectively correct standard. If we abandon these standards, if we hold that truth is a matter of experience, and above all, counsel, which deals with differentiating good and evil choices, good, better, and best choices, is simply a matter of experience, then abuse is what I don't like, and what I like is use. And if I want to get drunk, it's none of your business. As long as I don't uh, mess up your yard. That's more or less the point of view of a great many people in a position of influence. And it's this sort of thing that is peddled in the schools, in the universities, in the halls where laws are made, in which everyone is supposed to be and this thing is far more criminal in nature, as far as I'm concerned, than merely getting drunk on the weekend or spanking somebody too hard. Those are incidental incidents which do indeed affect God, but hardly as much as this kind of corruption of the mind and the heart systematic perversion. How can it come about? It comes about because there has been a radical transposition from the truth to personal experience as the basis for forming the conscience. Once again, the four fundamental errors singled out by the Holy Father in Veritatis Splendor, Splendor of Truth, we must ponder them. What are they? And they help us to understand this second point that we are coming to, where it is the very heart of New Age, as distinct from the old Heliasm. First, freedom has no relationship to truth. Freedom has no relationship to the will of God. Justice, like truth, can only be defined in reference to the one who says, I am the way of truth. It's the important thing for us to understand what we are praying for when we say, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. People can talk, gossip, prattle all they want about peace and justice. But if they do not wish to talk first about how the human will, the human heart, is only just to the extent that it is one with the will of God, as that is revealed through his only begotten Son, it is all fraudulent. It is all simply an abuse of language. Justice then becomes whatever I think is right. And if I'm top dog, you better bark when I say bark, and you had better jump when I say jump. That explains.
explains what has happened in every modern tyrannical society. There's been more tyranny in the 20th century than in all the other centuries of human history when you put together. That's not my assessment. That's the assessment of sound scholarly historians who have written about what has happened within the lifetime of most of us sitting in this room. What may we see and say then about the spirituality then of those who make use of the Enneagram, Centering Prayer, Jungian Psychology, TM, Transcendental Meditation, Zen Buddhism, LSD, you know, a little, little bit of mind expansion by the use of drugs, whiskey, whatever you want to, uh, want, want, want to use. You can do the same thing. You can roll with the holy rollers on all fours. Justin is the one who wrote it, and if there's time afterwards in the quest, I'll read you the poem about the Holy Rollers at Dayton for testing evolution. He pointed out a curious thing. The evolutionist in the name of reason proclaims that there's no difference between the monkey and the man, and the monkey can produce a man. It takes some stretching of reason to figure out how you can prove by reason that there's no difference between a reasonable animal and one that's unreasonable. Most of us think there's a very fundamental difference, a gap, an abyss that cannot be bridged. And the second is that the holy rollers, rolling around on all fours, are seeking to prove that there's absolutely no similarity between the human animal and any other animal. Two groups apparently opposed. What do they have in common? They're both irrational. And that's why they end up supporting each other in the end, even though they're always fighting with each other. In any case, what is the spirituality of these people? The first element is irrationality. Thinking clearly, trying to account for what you are thinking about in terms of principles which are fixed and unchanging, such as the principle of contradiction, to take one that everybody can understand. The whole is greater than the part. Anyone who says it isn't, isn't it cannot be considered a human being from this point on, at least kind of function in human society. But there are many people in high cases, including places of learning, who think that the principle of contradiction is nonsense. It tells you immediately the character of their thinking. You need not go any further. The only important thing is never sign a contract with them. You will never get ahead right and you will be taken. The second thing, however, is a very important one. It was noted by Pope Leo XIII, you know, the letter in which he condemned what was then known a hundred years ago as Americanism. Here, simply one of the points of the Americanists, or those who were said to be Americanists, all the Americans said the Americanists were in France, and where the French were pinning it all on us. Well, there were a lot of them in France at that time, but I don't think they were all there. There were a number of them here. Some of them occupied positions in the clergy. Here, I simply wish to note, they distinguish between active and passive virtues. Such a distinction had never been heard of before in the history of the church. What did they need? Active virtues. They were the good virtues. They were the ones, as it were, that contributed to manifest destiny. They contributed to progress. They contributed to the expanding, the gross national project. Passive virtues were the ones that were irrelevant to building up a better world. But note, they appear to be opposed. The activist, when he gets tired of being an activist, wants quiet. Passivity, it used to be quietism, was the 17th century Spanish heresy. It was called Quakerism in England, in the Protestant, the Protestant world. It reappears in a secular form as those who favor active virtue, those who favor Passive virtue. The active virtue, like, where are the passive virtues? Why, there turn out to be none other than nirvana. The complete destruction of any thought, of any desire, characteristic of the old oriental, Mr. Zen Buddhism. What are you trying to do by expanding your consciousness? By taking a trip, by using a little LSD or heroin? What you're trying, as it were, to attain that state of quiet and passive. 
and many people think that this is what we mean by contemplation. It is not at all what is meant by our Lord by contemplation. The operative distinction for the Catholic is that between use of some good for the sake of some other end and enjoyment of the end itself. The important thing is to know what is the end, the only end that can satisfy the human heart. St. Augustine summed it up nicely in his Confessions. Our hearts are restless until they rest in the O Lord. He meant Jesus. And this is why he reacted so strongly, and I share his reaction, to a certain Celtic monk by the name of Pilatius. His Celtic name was Morgan, meaning man of the sea. He was a very popular spiritual director in the late 4th century, and he had many Catholic priests and not a few Catholic bishops under his spiritual direction. What was his basic? You didn't really need the cross. You didn't really need the grace of Christ, sanctifying grace, actual grace, all those things the catechism talks about, all those things defined by the Council of Trent. What you really needed was willpower. What you really needed was active virtue. What you really needed was a relevant engagement in the works of this world. That will make you a good person, a mature person. If you think there are a lot of Pelagians around today, You are quite right. And to a certain extent, you can only understand the silly season of the new age as an attempt to escape from that sort of thing. But it is no escape, because it's the same thing in reverse form. It's the same pragmatism. It's the same utilitarianism. It's the same attempt to define good and evil simply in terms of experience. Try it out. It's great. You'll never regret that you took the trip to the moon. But of course, if you get to the moon and the spaceship breaks down, it's not exactly a pleasant place to be. The key point is, there is only one blessedness. It's found where God is. Not in this present state of human existence, but in the life to come. And the only way in which one can reach heaven is to make use of the means of grace, to put into practice with the grace of God all those things that our Lord has told us to do. Because our time on earth is a time to prepare ourselves for heaven. That is the first reason that the whole visible world was made, to enable us to know God, and then to provide us the means for serving him and for serving our neighbor. Only on that basis can the social order be properly organized. Now, what happens? I'm running out of time here. I'll have to tell you. What happens? If you accept this pseudo-distinction between active and passive virtues, you get the usual syndrome. You've got to peel off. If you really want to get peace, you peel off all of those uh, factors all of those elements that pertain to normalcy, and then you get at the real me. You find the real I. And the real I is divine, is God. You are God. You are the eternal spirit. Makes you feel good. That's what's called affirmative action. But it also requires, guys, that you identify that discovery with something quite real and tangible. When we recognize that need, we see exactly what is happening by the attempt to construct a paradise on earth. Something that will guarantee, will provide that security which is absolutely indispensable to any pretense at happiness. A good time that comes to an end is always tinged by sadness. St. Augustine notes it over and over again. The New Year's party comes to an end. And then you've got to sleep it off. Life comes to an end. An account has to be given. No one can run away from that forever. We have two ways of approaching the organization 
of life on earth. We can approach it as the New Agers do, as the sectarians do, as the millinerists do, Kilius, whatever name you want to give him, the medieval Joachimites, brethren of the free spirit. We can say you can find justice and peace and blessedness on earth. It's a great thing if you can pull it off. But generally speaking, those who have attempted it have always ended up making earth a kind of antechamber of hell from which people want to escape, become so far. Or we can seek first the kingdom of his God and his justice and all the other things will be added. Or even on earth, we shall have what used to be called the blessings of a Christian civilization. The blessings of good order. The blessings that genuine authority, authority based on truth, authority based on justice, where the right to command does not consist in any kind of personal accomplishment, however great, where the right to bind consciences does not depend on the superior sanctity of the sectarian leader, but is based on one thing that everyone accepts as right and true and just, and that is the authority of the truth which you may read, equals the authority of Jesus Christ. It's a wonderful thing. It's not a threat. It's a wonderful blessing. And this is why, even in a secular culture, for all its perversion, you can find many, many tributes. The tribute that vice plays to virtue. The tribute that the secularist ultimately gives, grudgingly, but gives, to the blessings of Christian culture. The spiritual, the dogmatic, the metaphysical dimension is rejected out of hand. But most sane people can take the silly season for so long. They can take so much heavy rock. They can take so much pornography. They can take only so much philandering. Human nature revolts, which is a clear sign he wasn't made for these things. So these are the two aspects. Once the priority of the truth. Once the kingship of Jesus Christ. I mean the kingship he talked about in the kingship he exercises is rejected as irrelevant. Theoretically and practically. Then we always get almost inevitably two things historically. One, the collapse of the spatial center on which all our lives, personal lives, are based uh, into something purely subjective, purely interior, it's arbitrary, it's me. And if there's anything boring, if there's anything that is absolutely sickening by itself, it's looking at myself. And if there's anything disgusting to others, it's saying, what a great saint am I. Everybody laughs. You should laugh. We all should laugh at that sort of a thing. It's ridiculous. And the second thing that happens, the temporal factor, where we don't believe, first of all, in life everlasting, as we recite in the creed every Sunday, where we don't believe any longer in the true resurrection, the resurrection of the body, what happens? We inevitably try to find a paradise on earth, not just the Marxists, not just the communists. What Chesterton remarks about Capitalists and communist life. It's just two different versions of the same materialism. The communist is going to give it by placing the few who control everything in charge of the state. And the materialist who says he believes in private property is going to give it to everybody by managing everybody else's property. The only difference, says Chesterton, between the two forms of materialism is the fact that in one system, the few who own everything are anonymous. And the other, you know who they are because they're the bosses of the political party. Catholic social doctrine has a completely different orientation. And we can see in a certain sense how right it is when we see what are the ultimate consequences of anyone who continues to pretend that the secular state can bring forth you end up a new nature or something like that. Now I want to come to the final point, the judgment. There is a judgment. What the catechism, 
what the old-fashioned dogmatic theologian like St. Thomas and St. Bonaventure and Blessed John Dunscotus, St. Augustine, and other assorted saints, whom everyone has forgotten today, unfortunately, they give us a judgment beforehand. That's exactly what our Lord did. He came into this world not to condemn it, but to save it. And the first thing he did was teach dogmatically. Yes, he taught dogmatically, with authority. All his contemporaries know that. It was the difference between his way of teaching and the fashionable way. The fashionable way today is no different from the fashion of 2,000 years ago. There are no generation gaps. The only myth is the myth that there are generation gaps, that our culture is so advanced, that our technology is so different, that we can't understand anybody else and nobody can understand us. There is a judgment there that is true. And it's a blessed judgment. There's also a judgment at the end. And I've already referred to that many times. What is that judgment? It is the judgment on those who refuse to believe. They are already judged. The refusal to accept the light of faith when it is offered. The antecedent refusal even to think that there is such a thing as a truth. To have the arrogance to think that everything can be doubted. Whoever gave you the right to call into question the nature of the mind, the nature of the heart. There is arrogance with a vengeance. And if you pursue it, you inevitably say, I would never believe that man. What good can come from that man? It's the difference between a disciple who is guileless. That's what sincerity used to be, like Nathaniel. Or one whose heart is brimful of guile. And here we see why a Franciscan Pope sticks the fifth refer to St. Bonaventure and St. Thomas as two candlesticks burning brightly in the house of God in the church. Saints like these did a tremendous service because they really did think. And they used their minds, and more than that, they used their hearts too, in the context of the life of faith. And they were able to illustrate practically the basic differences between good and evil, truth and error, where it bears on the origin, conduct, and end of the human enterprise, both personal and social. They were not ideologues. They didn't confuse psychology, sociology, political theory with doctrine. They really did understand what St. Paul meant when he said, don't get involved with all these novelties of language, because they're not really novelties. And don't get yourself confused with all the contradictions of pseudoscience. There's a lot of pseudoscience. There's a lot of pseudo-theology. And it's very, very authoritarian. Not authoritative, authoritarian. It's the imposition of one creature's will on another. That's always the goal of temptation. It's always the goal of selling you the idea that you formed your conscience. How many people say, it's okay for me to thumb my nose at Humane Vitae. It's okay for me to thumb my nose at the profound social tradition of the church, which is the teaching of Jesus Christ. It's not so much that they commit a sin. It's the fact that they deny there is any such thing as sin. Only physical evil. It's a terrible thing to die. And they think it's cruel for us to say, no, we are not worried about dying. We're worrying about whether we're going to die a holy death. That's the important thing. Pray for us now and at the hour of our death. Amen. I want to conclude with a reference now to Genesis. After Adam and Eve ate the apple, what happened? 
their eyes were opened and they discovered that they were nude and they were embarrassed. They were on a guilt trip, as we say today. What did God do? He came into the garden and he punished them, but he didn't condemn them. He could have. Brother, he said, I will put enmity between you, the serpent, and the woman. Between your seed, your offspring, your brood, and her offspring. And he or she or both of them, however you want to read it, practically the conclusion is the same. Will crush your head and you shall lie in wait for her heel. There's one thing that science can't do. Science, up to a point, can give you an analysis of the new age. But you'll never draw anybody back from it. Merely by giving them a long-winded philosophical scientific critique. Because you're dealing, as Father Park was said, not with a rational theory. Erroneous, but rational. You're dealing with a movement. A movement that is directly opposed to another movement. The movement of faith. Faith is eminently reasonable, even if you can't prove it. All you have to admit is that your intellect isn't as powerful as God's. That he knows more than you. And if he tells you something, it's well worthwhile saying it's very reasonable even if you don't understand experimentally why it's a good thing. If he tells you not to take poison, but I think it's a good thing, follow his advice, even though you've never experimented with poisons. There are people, however, who do that kind of experimenting, usually on their neighbor. So the first point is he did not condemn them, however, he understood quite well what is at the root of every temptation to which we succumb. A sin against the light. Not always immediate and complete, but always potentially there. That's why it's so dangerous to remain in the state of mortal sin. is to walk in the darkness. I'm not talking about Edison's electric light, that kind of light. Because that's not real light. There's another kind of light, far more important. The worst kind of darkness is the darkness of sin. There is only one answer to a movement that directly opposes itself to the light. And that is the promise of the Redeemer and his mother. G.K. Chesterton was converted to the Catholic Church in 1922. A year later, more or less, a certain Sir Arnold Vaughan, at that time a fanatical anti-Catholic, wrote these lines on Roman converts. He meant, of course, Chesterton. You hear a great deal about his mother. For Our Lady has become the patron of a party, whereas Christ was never a party leader. It's a typical English put down. Yes, of course, we non-Catholics respect Christ. We don't become Catholics because Catholics are a party group, sectarian, the Marian sect. Chesterton, with his dogmatic mind, but in a very charitable way, wrote these verses. Ultimately, they had a great deal to do with moving Sir Armstrong towards becoming the great Catholic that he became in 1938. Great apology to defender of faith. He was stung by these lines, and you appreciate why if I read them. But afterwards, he realized the sting was a charitable sting. Without that sting, he would have never seen the underlying error that he had bought into. And it is the underlying error of all of these movements, one of which is manifests the stupidity of it all, because it is so silly, the New Age. A party question. The golden roses of the glorious mysteries, 
grew wild as cowslips on the common land. Hers was more humanities than histories, until you ban them as a badge is banned. One of the characteristic features of all these modern movements. They differ amongst themselves, but they all hate the mother of God and anything that represents her traditionally. The silver roses of the sorrow of Mary and the red roses of her royal birth were free till you turn petulant and wary when weeding wild flowers from your mother earth. Earth worship. Mother of man, the mother of the maker, silently speaking as the flowering trees, but made of her a striker and a breaker, who spoke no scorn even of men like these. She named no hypocrites a viper race, our Lord's reference to the Jews as children of the liar and murderer from the beginning. That's strong language. Our Lord is not a party man, said Arnold Lund, our lady was. She named no hypocrites of viper race. She nailed no tyrant for our bullpine cur. I was her, tell that dog from me. She flogged no hucksters from the holy place, cleaning out the temple. He wasn't exactly a pacifist on that occasion. Why was your new wise world in dread of her? Whom had she greeted and not graced in greeting? Whom did she touch and touch not his peace? And what are you that made of such a meeting quarrels and quibbles and a taunt to tease? Who made that in a fortress? What strange blindness beat on the open door of that great heart, stood on his guard against unguarded kindness, and made the sun a secret set apart. How strange that all these groups set up their armor to defend themselves against a visit from Mary. By this we measure you upon your showing, so many shields to her who bore no sword, all your unnatural nature and the flowing of sundering rivers down so hard to fort. We know God's priests had drunken iniquity. To our sins, too, did such offenses come. This acknowledgement of the sins of Catholics, including priests and bishops. Mad Martin's bell, the mouth of anarchy. Martin Luther doesn't change the fact that he had his faults also. Knox, that's John Knox the organizer of that horrible Scotch Calvinism. Knox and the horror of that hollow drum. We know the tale. Half-truth and double treason. Borgia and Torquemada in the throng. Borgia is Alexander VI. Bad men who had no right to their right reason. Good men who had good reason to be wrong. But when that tangled war our father's wage stirred against her, then could we hear right well through roar of men not wrongfully enraged. The little hiss that only comes from hell. That's what we hear in the midst of all the silliness, in all the absurdities. We should recognize that. Our aim is not to destroy these people. And in stating these truths clearly, it is not our aim to put them down, but in a certain sense, to sting as Shesterton stung Arnold to make them recognize what indeed is involved, that they can find forgiveness as we have found forgiveness, but it is necessary first to acknowledge the goodness of Mary. That is the secret. And that is what is the first step that can be done. We're accused of pietism, we're accused of devotionalism. Perhaps sometimes we are guilty of those things. But the old axiom used to be, Usum non tolit abusus. Abuse does not deny the right to use. Because some people are erroneously devoted to our lady because some people 
have misused the name of her son does not mean we should not be devoted to her and that we should not make ourselves his servants and disciples. And it's precisely by introducing Our Lady that we will set the basis. We may not see the results, but the results will come. The two hearts, the Immaculate Heart and the Sacred Heart, they go together. It's the only possible way of restoring not only the hope of salvation, but sanity. Because that's what the silly season is all about. A rejection of the truth. It can take a scientific form. We have a right to do, to experiment. But not only is it a horror to abort children in order to get parts to experiment with, there is a profound diabolical error that is being enshrined in the very fabric of the state, the culture, and the society, economics, not excluded. Because wherever these things happen, that's the bottom line. Somebody is going to make, and it's going to be a profit at the expense of souls, the genuine happiness of who knows how many persons. And hence, it's not by organizing politics. It's not going to be by raising money. These things are secondary. The first thing that is necessary is that every believer, and we want to make as many, and we make no bones about it, we do want to convert. We do understand that salvation is only in the Catholic Church. Salvation is only in the name of Jesus. You can't separate those two, the head from the body. You can only do it if you get rid of Mary. That's what's happened in the Western world. Everything is falling apart. And so I will simply conclude, and then you can really have a have the break that was promised with, that, with this reflection drawn from Chesterton. The little hiss from hell. How can you counteract the little hiss from hell? There's only one sure means of doing it. Make yourself a child of Mary. Consecrate yourself entirely to her. Make her known. Introduce her. And if a person can recognize the difference between that gentle virgin mother and the hiss from hell, they'll soon abandon all these horrid practices. They'll find the courage to do it. They may have to struggle with virtue, but there will be once again the will to do so. Note well, that initial will, that hope, that desire, that too is a grace. It's not that we love God first. That was Pelagius' position. No, God loved us first. So much that he sent his only begotten son to be a propitiation on the cross. He was born of the Virgin Mary precisely that he might do that. And the son came and he had the greatest love possible gave his life for his brethren. That's all of us. This is the true perspective. It's the only valid perspective. And if we follow our Lord's very precise instructions on these points, first, from the first pages of Scripture, obey God. That's what Our Lady says. Do what He tells you to do. That's what the Father says. Listen to Him, my beloved Son, my own God and Son. And the other is, if they come telling you, there he is, that's what the New Age are saying, the Christ is there, ready to come. He's 15 years ago, was in Chelsea, the suburb of London. That's where he had an apartment. They knew the address. And if you joined up, you could, uh, don't go out. Either to the desert, neither to the hermitages, neither to the palaces, neither to the halls of academia. There's one place to find him. And that, that will be the final point, absolutely. It's in the tabernacle. Think about it, and you will see how wonderfully our Lord has provided for everything, both our spiritual and our temporal welfare. 
that the scribe has were therefore to introduce everyone to his mother, so they might begin to understand the hope of that calling that he has given to all, the riches of the inheritance in the saints, and the wonderful, unconquerable power of his grace, the same power that was at work at him, raising from the dead. St. Paul to the Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 18, and the following. Now we have to break, and I'll reappear at question.